Hi, welcome to FBC's So That Missions podcast. Today we're going to hear from David Chan, our instructor for week four uh, for Perspectives. Hope you enjoy. Hi, and welcome to season four of FBC Missions So That podcast. This is an encouraging place to hear how God is working in and around us. We know that he blesses his people so that they can bless the world around them. This season, we're going to be talking to our instructors that have come through from the Perspectives class that we've done spring of 2024, and we're going to be discussing how to join God in all that He is doing. Why is God working in our life, church, and community? It's so that through us, the world will know that He is near. Hey, everybody. This is Pastor Chad uh, with FBC's So That Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, We've got a great guest with me today in the studio. His name is David Chan. Uh, how are you doing, David? Good, Chad. Thank you. Good. Great to have you here. Um, so, David, uh, you're our week four instructor uh, for our Perspectives class that is ongoing here in the spring of 24, and uh, we're so glad to have you with us uh, today. Um, lots of, of great things coming out of this this class. So, uh, before we jump into kind of what you're talking about tonight, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from? What do you do? Tell us about your family, uh, just so people listening get to know you a bit. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm David Chan. I'm originally from El Paso, Texas. Is David your actual name, David? Okay. No, you want that story. All right. (laughs) (laughs) I am Jorge David Chan. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I'll uh, I'll unpack that more tonight, but uh, (laughs) Mexican-American with a Chinese last name. So that by itself is one of my favorite things. There you, go. you know that about David. You're already <laughs> like, that's an interesting thing about David. I love it. But you've got to come to lesson four to hear more about it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, originally from El Paso, uh, my parents were missionaries. So I grew up going back and forth, living in Mexico for many years. Uh, but then eventually high school and college in El Paso. Um, married my wife, met and married my wife, Christy, at uh, Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth. Um, we have three wonderful kids, uh, ages 19, 21, and 24 really see them as our primary disciples and um, hoping to pass on that love for the nations to that next generation and seeing a little bit of that. We currently live in McAllen, Texas. Uh, You know where that is. Uh, Four hours south of here, more or less, uh, on the Texas-Mexico border. Um, I'm a pastor on staff there, the executive pastor and interim lead pastor. Um, But I've been a missions pastor there before, a missions pastor in other places, and a missionary in Georgia for five years. So we have a lot of different Parts to I didn't story. know they sent missionaries to Atlanta. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Georgia, the country. Oh, the country. Yes. There's a country called Georgia. Uh-huh. It's uh, amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I love having you here with me, David. We've been friends for a good long time. Um, we worked at the same church. You were the, my predecessor. You're the missions pastor before I was the missions pastor there at the church in McAllen. And, and then as a missionary in, in Georgia, we got to visit several times and you introduced us to that incredible country and, and we have a love for it ourselves now. And uh, so <clears throat> it's such a blessing to have you here uh, with me, David. Watching your family grow, watching your kids grow up, seeing their heart for the Lord and for the nations and and uh, and all of it has been so much fun. And uh, and you're a few years ahead of me, so I'm watching your life and get to see kind of what's what's a couple of years in front of me as far as my kids. Um, you know, our kids, my oldest is 14 <laughs> and uh, and yours is graduating from, just graduated from college, your oldest, and the next one's about to graduate from college. And so... Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. you're 10 years in front of me and, uh, it's, it's a uh, daunting to look forward to, but then I see a family like yours. I think there's hope that it's going to turn out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We can tell you what not to do, um, but no, it's, it's true. It's always good to have someone just a little bit ahead of you to see and say, okay, yeah, this is doable. Um, yeah. well, that's, that's amazing. Uh, you have been following the Lord for your whole life and you've been a career, uh, minister, missionary, um, and so, uh, how did you get to know perspectives? How did you first interact with this class, and and kind of how did you get involved with it? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I was reflecting on that because as I was preparing lesson four, I realized uh, in one of your other speakers that you had um, earlier this year, uh, Jeff Lewis. Uh, I I heard I learned from him after having my first true cross cultural overseas uh, missionary experience, and I realized that a lot of the 
principles of perspectives I had begun to hear and learn and grow from, but I had never seen it packaged in the way perspectives did until even after I was a missions pastor already. I'd already been mobilizing, <clears throat> been training, uh, been trying to send people. And then I discovered perspectives around 2005, 2006, more or less, uh, there in the Rio Grande Valley. You know, the coordinators there were very active in trying to get churches in the border to get involved. Uh, so I figured, you know, I'm a missions pastor. I better learn more about missions. <laughs> and so I went to Perspectives and uh, learned a lot and really enjoyed um, the, the way it was all put together in a way that you could really systematically go through for 15, 16 weeks and come out with a really good holistic view of not only of missions, but the biblical basis of missions and cultural and strategic challenges and all the things that, sure. that have to do with it. Sure. No, that's that's really funny. I think my introduction to perspectives was almost the same time, two thousand five, six in Seattle. Uh, I was already a missions pastor as well, and I uh, heard about the class and thought it sounded interesting, and uh, and took it and and then have had many different engagements with it <clears throat> over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, so now you're teaching for perspectives. What classes? What lessons have you taught? Is, is it mainly been lesson four? Or are there other other lessons as well? I, I also did lesson two several times, but it seems like lately it's been mostly four. I've done a couple of the history ones as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But two and four tend to be the ones I. I'm asked to do the most. Well, awesome. Awesome. Well, tell us about lesson four. What are we going to talk about tonight? Give us just a little snapshot of, of, of what the, our students will hear yeah. um, for those that can't be at the class. Yeah. Um, you know, the first four lessons and, and somewhat the fifth as well, as it bridges into the next section, but, but especially the first four lessons are the biblical basis, right? And, and um, there's, a, there's a quote that we talk about that says, biblical Christians need biblical reasons. And I think that's just true more than ever for everything we do as, as believers, right? Let's, let's identify what is our biblical reason for doing this. And missions is no different, right? It's easy to get, get sideways or sidetracked on, on mm-hmm. why we do missions or what it's for. So uh, lesson four kind of comes at the, at, the, kind of at the culmination of that, of the biblical basis for missions. You know, it's in the heart of God. It's in the story of God. It, there's a kingdom element to it, lesson three. And lesson four is is the mandate for the nations. And that emphasis, well, the whole thing is an emphasis, right? It's a mandate. Sure. And how is that different from just a command? A mandate carries historic significance. It carries like that presidential authority. When a president says, mm. I have a mandate, it's like they're given they're given the the responsibility uh, in a weighty manner, right, to make mm-hmm. a difference. So, so Jesus gives us the mandate. But it's not just mandate for evangelism. It's mandate for world missions, right? It's, it's mandate for the nations. And I love how this lesson ties the Old Testament with the new through the life of Jesus. Right? Mm-hmm. Jesus fulfills his role, his part of the mandate, and then gives it to us as his church and commissioning us, commissioning us with his mandate. And it just reminds us and it centers us that <coughs> our mission, no matter where we're located in the world, you know, as a local church, our mission is always to the nations. So yes, it includes our local environment. Sure. But we've got to always have an eye towards all nations, all people groups, because that's Jesus's heart. And that's, he reflected the heart of God from the very beginning of scripture that all nations would, would be blessed through him. Yeah. It's, it's really uh, a continuation. If, if you've been following along with the last few podcasts, you know, lesson one is uh, our God's a missionary God. Lesson two is the story of his glory. Uh, lesson three is your kingdom come. And now here, lesson four is a mandate for the nations. Uh, it, just looking at lesson five is unleashing the gospel, right? And, and, and really you see this progression where you're looking at vast amounts of scripture. Um, in some points, it's overwhelming just to see the, the weight of, of how many verses, how many different biblical writers include in their, in their um, almost thesis type statements these these ideas that this is not just for us, not just for Israel. It's for mm-hmm. the nations who are watching, the nations that surround them, the nations that are scattered to the very ends of the earth. And and there's these verses over and over and over in the scope of what God's doing and has been doing and He's planning to do throughout history uh, goes far beyond any one people. It, it goes it's he's calling a people to himself so that through them all peoples will engage with him Mm -hmm. and uh, and it really is is shocking for our students it's it's one of the things by lesson four uh already uh, multiple students have said i've been a believer 
for a very long time, and I've never seen things like this. Mm-hmm. I've never seen this picture of God's plan to reach all the peoples. And so it really stands out as a, a unique thing. And if you're listening today, you're like, oh, I already know that. Like, you know it. But man, if you take some time and just look at the weight behind it, you realize that what God is doing and has been doing and continues to do in us and through us is far bigger than the way we act often. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, while we might know that God has a heart for all peoples, we act like we're the end of those people. Yeah. Like, and, uh, and, and in some ways, <laughs> if you think about how Jerusalem is where this all started, we're kind of the ends of the earth from there. Right. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah. there's still peoples remaining that have never heard the gospel. Um, so, yeah. so that's awesome. Tell, tell me more about it. Yeah, well, and, that's, and that goes back to what we were saying earlier, right? How even as a missions pastor, I knew that. But I had never seen it laid out this way in a way that's so systematic, it builds upon itself, and, and really is compelling to understand, like, this is, this is the why. This is the why behind missions. And, and, and really, we need that. We need that, or else every other motivation will eventually fall short, right? Um, so one, one thing that I really like that, um, about Lesson 4 is, is as we focus on Jesus, we see, you know, many, he's the hinge of Scripture, right? Not only from Old Testament and New Testament, but but he's also the bridge where um, there's a fascinating passage we're going to look at tonight in Luke chapter 4, where Jesus comes back to, to Nazareth. He's in his hometown. He's welcomed as a hometown hero. And in, this, in that very same passage, he goes from hero to zero, right? They want to kill him. They yeah, villain him almost. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. And, uh, and the why, if you look at that, is at the heart of our lesson, right? He is, he's focused on the nations, not just on the people of Israel, mm-hmm. and they want to kill him for it. So that's... That's, you know, that's something that you don't typically unpack unless you're in a perspectives type sure. course where you can see it from that perspective and understand. It, it gives us insight into what's happening in some of those stories that otherwise you might be like, well, what happened there? Why, yeah. why the sudden change? Well, tonight we'll talk about Yeah, that. it's not the miracles. It's not that they're disappointing him. It's that he literally says, I'm not here for you. Mm-hmm. I'm here for everyone. And right. it's so frustrating with them. It's like the Jonah narrative where he's mad, not because... God's going <clears> to <throat> send him to Nineveh. He's mad because he knows that by God sending him to Nineveh, God's going to restore or draw mm-hmm. Nineveh into a good relationship with him. And he hates the Ninevites. Like, <laughs> right. I knew, he accuses God, I knew you're a God that's merciful and long-suffering and, <laughs> and slow to anger and con- great in compassion. Like, I knew before you ever sent me, that was what's going to happen to God. <laughs> you're like, that's actually supposed to be the heart of a missionary. Right. You know, so, right. That's well, th- that's, that's, story. that's yeah. amazing. Uh, I love it. I, I, I can't wait to hear how it goes tonight. Um, how, what are some personal stories as you interact with this content? What are some, some stories that you're going to tell, or maybe one or two that just, uh, that, that, that drive it home for you that has made this, this content impact, uh, mm-hmm. how you see both mm-hmm. your ministry, um, maybe even historically your ministry, you've been in ministry for a good while. Um, and so how, how do you see this working itself out or around you? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, so it's, you know, it, it causes me to reflect on how God has led me and how he has uh, given me opportunities to be involved in his story, you know, in his mission, um, in his mandate. <laughs> and uh, so it's just cool to reflect on those, and I'll be able to tell some of those stories tonight. Like even just being in Georgia, Georgia is a strategic location, you know, the, Georgia, the country. And um, I, I wouldn't have known that. You know, I didn't know much about Georgia at all until we got started putting it on our heart and we started looking at it. And the more I looked at it, the more I saw, wow, this is a strategic place. It's in the heart of the 1040 window, although it's not considered a an unreached country or people group, but it just, it's a crossroads. And <coughs> their, their national flag is the symbol of a cross. And it, to me, it symbolizes the crossroads that Georgia is strategically for the world. And just one way that ties into tonight's lesson is, you know, we're going to look at briefly um, Pentecost, right? And how God waits to send the Holy Spirit to the disciples until the day of Pentecost when what? When there are nations from every surrounding, people from every surrounding nation there, mm-hmm. And they're able to hear the wonders of God in their language. So, so God is a strategic God. He's always setting things up in a way that, that can maximize this movement that he cares so passionately about, right? And so it was just cool to see that he did that for us. He put us in Georgia in a place that you know, I least expected kind of situation. I would have never chosen it as, you know, super strategic. And yet we saw, we, we continue to see, you know, as we stay connected with, with partners there, uh, what a strategic place it is. 
Yeah, it's it's such an amazing place. Like you are the one that <clears throat> stirred my heart for that nation as well, and and uh, and I I find so many parallels between maybe even ancient Israel and its kind of strict adherence to a historic relationship with God, but that historic relationship had turned so rigid in its performance base that it was hard to find. God in it enough mm-hmm. so that God himself lived among them and they rejected him. Right. right. <clears throat> what a sad thing that a country that was devoted to the God most high expecting his Messiah missed them. Right. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> what a sad story. <clears throat> and in many ways I find like the, the long, so Georgia is a 90 plus percent Christian country, mm-hmm. Eastern um, Orthodox, but it's Orthodox, right. Eastern mm-hmm. Orthodox. And the way that that has manifest itself is while they've had access to Christ for these many millennia, <clears throat> they also are very far from a relationship mm-hmm. um, with Jesus. He's not real and close and personal to mm-hmm. them. And uh, and even to suggest that he should be is offensive. And their right. t- their responses are often like, who are you to tell me? I'm Georgian. We've been Christian since before Constantine was Christian. How right. how could you have anything to tell me? We should be telling you. And, uh, and, and there's so much. Uh, I heard a, a video the other day that said to be Christian, to be Georgian is to be Christian. Like mm-hmm. there's there's no difference, and mm-hmm. and yet and yet when you have an opportunity to have a conversation, um, it's so hard mm-hmm. uh, to mm-hmm. see um, to see them submit themselves to Christ in any kind of way. Like, um, which is common in most in many Orthodox countries. Mm-hmm. And I, I say that it may be common in many evangelical communities as well that are. Our uh, experience and our practice is one form of faith, but uh, mm-hmm. live it out is a different thing sometimes yeah. entirely. Yeah. <clears throat> but but yeah. yeah, the parallels there are seem so similar to me. Right with ancient Israel, yeah, yeah, that's so true. And and I think that underscores the fa- the the truth or the the need that the mandate to reach the nations is true for every generation. You know, every generation, every country, you know, needs that fresh movement of the gospel, or else you know generations later on will stagnate. Obviously, we know Western Europe, you know, it's considered now post-Christian, right? Um, and Eastern Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox countries also just, a lot of the the veneer of Christianity, a lot of the surface, you know, elements of it, but not that deep understanding of the gospel. And, and it's definitely missing. Yeah, who was it that said that? Like, every generation has a responsibility to reach their own generation, mm-hmm. that, that kind of thought process. Because you, you often, you see it in Scripture, <clears throat> There's a faithful generation followed by a generation that seems to take it for granted, mm-hmm. followed by a generation that is almost apathetic uh, and and only has the form, followed by a generation that is entirely disconnected from the their grandparents' faith. Right. Um, and then scripturally comes judgment or some sort of heavy persecution, which then brings about a generation mm-hmm. of faithfulness. And that cycle kind of repeats itself mm-hmm. uh, throughout the Old Testament. And you see the same cycle repeat itself in the years since the apostles, we look at scripture so many times when God has, has moved and, and many numbers of people have come to faith through some revival or through some, some extraordinary act of God. Uh, it seems just a few generations removed from, from Mm -hmm. some, some form of the faith. It's still there in structure and in form, but not in the, with the passion of its founders or the passion of those who discovered it uh, right. generations before. And so one of the tasks really is to pass on that passion to the next generation. You mentioned it when you were talking about your desire for your children to have the same or a similar heart for the nations or for, for other countries. And, and uh, I, I obviously hope the same thing, you know, we've, mm-hmm. we've served uh, many different ways to, to serve God uh, <coughs> here, but among the nations as well. And we mm-hmm. desperately want to see our kids, have that same heart. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think it's very important in, on that line, on that note, to also know that there are many ways that you can engage the mandate, right? We obviously need people to go, go overseas, go cross culturally, sure. go to the hard sure. places. But, you know, we'll, we'll touch base on that a little bit tonight. And I know throughout Perspectives, for sure, by the end of Perspectives, you'll talk about what are the different ways you can be involved. You can pray. And, and yeah. that's not a small thing. You know, you can course, give, you can go, you can mobilize, you can welcome. And our family, mm-hmm. I think that was key in our family. We, we had some, our, some of our kids' formative years. We were having international students, you know, dinner over at our house on a Friday night. And they would meet Syrians and Afghans and, you know, Koreans and pre- people from all over the world. And I think, you know, just simple things like opening your home to internationals. 
can have such a, a an, an impact and an effect to help that next generation, your kids, you know, have that sense of, oh, this is cool, this is important, this is good. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of ways we can be involved in the mandate, and I think that's something that um, that will help to 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 pass that on to the next generation if we recognize hey there's there's a way for everybody to participate in this yeah yeah and and you're you're so right um definitely as we get later on in the class we'll start talking about the the habits mm-hmm. of a of a, a world believer someone that that cares about the nations how can we work this into our disciplines how is it uh a way that that god has called all believers to participate in in mm-hmm. some in some form <clears throat> Um, with that said, you know, there's, there's so many needs around us, you know, uh, when we talk about the nations, people immediately jump to internationals, right? We think about other places. Uh, we think about the missionaries in Africa or missionaries in, in Turkey and Georgia or, you know, Moldova, we have partnerships in Moldova or the Philippines. We've been distant and far. Um, but the reality is that there's so many people around us today that represent the nations that may be living in our neighborhoods, living uh, right around us. Um, you know, I, even here in Bernie, you know, this is like um, one of the more conservative and probably um, specifically uh, singular <laughs> ethnicities. If you go to our church, there's not a lot of diversity in the church. And yet, even here in Bernie, which may be one of those places in Texas that is one of the least diverse places, it's quite diverse. Like there's mm-hmm. 30% of the school district is Hispanic. Uh, it's not mm-hmm. uh, It's not odd to see uh, Indian families. Um, it's not odd to hear about Afghan families in San Antonio. We have the military, which brings in lots and lots of diversity as well. And, uh, and so if you're looking, if you're trying, you can find mm-hmm. opportunities to engage people from other places without having to go very far. Right. It reminds me, Ralph Winter, the founder of Perspectives, used to always say that you shouldn't cross the ocean if you can't cross the street. Mm-hmm. And his, his task wasn't trying to discourage you from going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> his task was to say that everyone has a mission field. Everyone's mission right. field uh, is the connections that God has put around us. It's the relationships that we have day in and day out. And, uh, and some of those are going to be right there, right at your next door neighbor, right across the cul-de-sac from you, or right across the street from you, or just down the street, or the people you work with in the cubicle next door, or the office next door, or mm-hmm. people you buy your groceries from. You just go down the list. These are the people that you see, you live yeah. around, you interact with day in, day in and day out. And especially if you think that God may be opening doors for you to go um, overseas or, or go on some short-term trip or to engage, man, how much more should you engage with your your natural um, network mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> before you engage with a foreign network, even if that's, right. you know, down the street that you don't live in. Like there's there's such a, a focus. Uh, I think when we talk about missions, people think out there and it's such a big world that it's somewhat overwhelming, but really it starts with us having a, a passion and compassion for the people around yeah, us. It and starts uh, right where you are. And remember, God is a strategic God, right? So he's going to put people in front of you. He's placed you here yes, on purpose. Exactly, like uh, Exactly. If he hasn't moved you overseas, it's because he has a purpose for you here. That's right. Right? That's and right. Uh, so, man, I'm excited about tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. Me too. Um, Thank you. Anything else you'd like to share? Anything, anything that you think would be fun to drop onto the podcast? Any great <laughs> news? Oh man, <laughs> what, we're pregnant? No. Oh wait, 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 Art. Christy would not. <laughs> no, not at this stage of our lives. Uh, no, um, you know, I don't know why I thought about it earlier, but you're talking about perspectives and how, you know, I began to get involved uh, and then began to be a, a a speaker, began to you know mul- encourage people to take the class, and then it just because I'm bilingual, you know, in Spanish, it opened up doors in the Spanish speaking world, and I was able to be part of the first team that went to do perspectives in Cuba. And it was just really neat to see how God is using this tool now in many parts of the world to mobilize the rest of the, you know, the, the, the global church. Right. Yeah. And, um, and I just think that's another neat aspect of perspective. It's not just about North Americans and Europeans understanding missions and going for it. It's now spreading to where, you know, people from Latin America and Africa and Asia are taking these same concepts and, and joining the, the mission force in, in all sorts of different ways. And it's just becoming a global movement. And uh, again, it's just neat to be a part of that and neat to be able to see how God is, is again, strategically moving peoples and, and growing this, uh, this mission force 
so that in these last days, <laughs> however many days we have left, but in these last days, um, there could be a great movement in the world for God. You know, we live in a world of bad news just all the time, right? And so uh, it's it's cool to see how perspectives gives us that the insight into the good news of what is happening in the world. It really, it really it has had a massive impact. People, uh, many people have never heard of it, so they don't know uh, the impact it's had, but it, this year it celebrates 50 years, uh, 2024, 50 years of this class. Um, there's been five editions of the reader, um, several different kind of modifications of the class itself along the way. Um, but by and large, it's been very similar content. It was built out of a missions 101 course, mm -hmm. you know, back in the day. And, uh, and they wanted to make it available to a lot of people that weren't going to take seminary classes or become missionaries overseas. And right. so that's kind of how this was formed. Um, and it's really interesting, over 200,000 alumni. Mm. Um, and, uh, and now the global alumni is quickly catching up to the mm -hmm. U.S. North American-based alumni. And, uh, and it's really interesting to me because when you think about <clears throat> some of the big impacts, uh, when I first took perspectives, it was the first time someone had highlighted Matthew 24, 14, the verse that says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I had, I, I'd been a Christian, I'd read the Bible, I had been a pastor for some season, I had read through the gospels many times, so the first time I noticed that verse, and definitely the first time I noticed the tag at the end, and then the end will come. And the first time I heard that one of the prerequisites for Christ's return is for the accomplishment of the Great Commission, that all nations would hear this gospel mm -hmm. before he returns. And and that was shocking to me. Like I had never seen the attention drawn. There are actually many verses that indicate the same thing. It's not that that's just a one time, but that's probably the clearest. It's right. the easiest to see. Right. And, uh, and then to hear over the last 20 years, how that verse has really been, I would say adopted into mainstream. Like every mm -hmm. conference I go to, someone quotes that verse and quotes mm -hmm. that topic. And, uh, and then to find out later that that was really something perspectives highlighted for the first time. Mm -hmm. And now it's adopted into mainstream um, ministry to think about, Things like multiplication uh, movements. Uh, the first time I ever heard of a spontaneous multiplication of churches when those perspectives class, and I heard about this thing like T for T book, and and uh, and you start reading these stories, and they just sound ridiculous because you're like, how is it possible that you know millions of Chinese can come to faith mm -hmm. through one movement in a period of like five to seven years, mm -hmm. and you hear and read these stories, and it just it doesn't sound real. Right. It sounds like Acts 2, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and then you start learning that, that there are places in the world where God is moving just like he did there. Mm -hmm. And it's shocking. It's shocking because you're like, well, why isn't he doing that here? And then you get to a whole another great, great group of questions. Yeah. And, uh, and it really did blow me away um, just how, how it continues to impact the world. I, 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 would, I, would ask, I would guess that its impact is really, at this point, limit it's it's, it's, Im it's impossible yeah. to know yeah. the breadth and scope and impact that perspectives has had over the last 50 years on on global missions and mainstream christianity mm -hmm. um and now it's in bernie <clears throat> well i was i was uh i was in nigeria to meet some friends of yours mm -hmm. um diddy and and wally were they your fr did you, they 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 came to us through sam and mother yeah, right i knew I, I got to meet diddy but i was more friends with sam the okay previous generation. so i didn't get to go to nigeria i've been i was planning to go um a loved one in our family passed away and i was not able to go on the trip um but they were they wanted me to go to their conference their national conference mm -hmm. in nigeria with capro international mm -hmm. and uh and and in the planning and development of it, they were talking about how back in the late 1980s, uh, a missionary from America came and said, you guys need this class. And they took the perspectives class to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And then they put a whole group, a couple hundred pastors through this class. And out of that, Capro was one of the things formed. And as I got to know Capro, I was amazed to see that this Nigerian mission sending organization was training and sending Nigerians to many places that we couldn't go. Mm -hmm. Northern India, uh, they were working with underage people groups in Kenya and different parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I became shocked to find out that there's an indigenous work of Nigerians that is going far beyond what I expected or, or anticipated uh, from a non-American entity. Right. And they were funded, founded, and kind of inspired 
initially through this class. And, and uh, so we have continued to have different partnerships with them at Calvary uh, before I came here to FBC. And, uh, and they're some of the most amazing missionaries we know. Yeah, they continue to move to a place, develop disciples, train them, fully equip them, hand off leadership to them, and then they go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And now you have another indigenous group doing the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. They have been highly effective. It's and, beautiful. Uh, yeah. and, and in many ways, I, I felt like when I was at Calvary that, that Diddy was a guy that could mentor me. There's a lot I could learn mm-hmm. from him. I didn't have the privilege of getting to know Sam uh, the same. way you did, but Sam would be same. the same kind of mm-hmm. the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, unbelievable how the Lord is is working, and um, yeah. and I'm so thankful uh, for for perspectives how it how it changed and impacted me as a missions pastor when I took it. I thought I knew a lot about missions, <laughs> and it really it really humbled me yeah. uh, and took me back to a a place of dependence on the Lord because I had a lot to learn and grow in and still do. Of course, we all do. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much uh, for thank coming for to Bernie. Yeah. This is a good class. Uh, we have had a really good experience so far, but we're still at the beginning. It's only week four. We've got mm-hmm. another nine weeks after this one and uh, 11 weeks. My math apparently is not <laughs> doing great today. <laughs> So uh, yeah. we we had fun today. We got to go see the old old tunnel, old train tunnel right. uh, in no comfort. Bats, though. Didn't get to see the bats. No, the, the, we were there in the middle of the day. They were sleeping apparently, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, Alamo Springs Cafe. They, they do have a good Texas. burger, best burger in Texas. <laughs> up their sign said, and I, yeah. I have to tell you, it was it's a pretty good burger. Yes, so. I agree. A lot of fun, David. We've Thank hung you, out. We've yeah. had food in many countries, and uh, now we've had food in the hill country. So that's right. <laughs> well, thank you. Those of you who are listening, I hope that you've enjoyed our podcast. If you have any questions, we'd love to tell you more about what God's doing here at FBC and through Perspectives. And uh, and if you're if you're interested at all, check out perspectives.org. Uh, there's always online classes if, if the timing doesn't work. And uh, hopefully that you've enjoyed this and uh, have a wonderful day and God bless. We are so thankful that you joined our podcast today. We would love to hear any feedback you may have for us. Remember, Psalm 67 says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. Don't forget why the Lord blesses us. It's so that we can be a blessing to those around us. Until next time, God bless.